We've been in this grace series, and we've been talking about what it looks like to not just receive grace, but live in grace and then extend grace. And we haven't even got to the extend grace. Spent four weeks talking about what does it look like to receive grace, and we've now walked into this one area called living in grace or growing in grace. And let me just ask you a question. How many of you... um, you received grace, and you know what I mean by that, right? I mean, you should if you came in those four weeks. Like, that's your conversion moment when you received grace. That's when you became a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. That was your turning point where you formerly did not belong to God's family and you gave your life to Christ. You believe he died on the cross for you, was resurrected, and he did that for you, that you could join his family because his innocence was given to you because he got your guilt, All right? That's a lot of wording, huh? You receive God's grace. How many of you, can, I'm just curious, in the last five years, you received God's grace? Like in the last five years, you became a follower of Christ. Good. Bunch of you. Um, I know this last, about 10 days ago, we were praying for somebody in our church who's connected to our, uh, our, comes every week and praying for her and she gave her life to Christ. And I read that on a communication card and I was like, awesome. I mean, when somebody that you've been praying for, that you know isn't a follower of Christ yet, and they become a follower of Christ, they've received God's grace, I'm telling you, it's thrilling because, I mean, their eternity's forever changed. So what do you do then? Like you receive God's grace, and you like stand around and wait and be like, all right, so I guess I wait here to go to heaven, like one day, and uh, what do you do with God's grace? I mean, you received it, now what do you do with it? The scriptures make it pretty clear. You're not just to receive it, but you're to grow in God's grace. Now, let me tell you where I found this. You don't have to turn there, but let me just read it to you because I want you in Hebrews chapter 4, okay? But in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, he states it this way. And by the way, who writes 2 Peter? Peter, yeah, not a trick question. <laughs> like, the pastor's setting me up here. No, Peter. And who knows about God's grace better than Peter? The guy who, after meeting Jesus, really just kind of fumbles his way with Jesus, gets it wrong so many times, but Jesus keeps restoring him. He knows a lot about God's grace, and he writes this letter in 2 Peter, and here's who he addresses it to. To those who, through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. All of that means this. He's writing to believers, people who are in the family of God, and here's what he writes in verse 2. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Well, why would he say that? Well, because it's, it's possible to have it in scarcity. <laughs> if he says, I want you to have grace this big, it has to then be possible to have it this big. So when you receive God's grace, you're a believer. And he says, here's what I'm praying for you. This is what I hope for you. This is what I want for you. I want you to experience a whole pile of, a whole mess of God's grace and peace. Because the reality is, is there's some people in God's family who don't have a whole pile and a whole mess of and a whole abundance of, of God's grace. They have a little bit of it. And I don't mean that they just got into God's family by just the, the, the skin of their teeth and they're like, oh man, you barely made it in. Woo! All of us barely made it in. Because it, it wasn't based off of what you did, it's what Jesus did for you. But here's what's interesting. If you look at how he ends his letter, here's the very last verse in Peter's letter. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to grow in two things, in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Now, how do you grow in knowledge? Well, you have to learn, and all of us get the whole, I need more knowledge. I read, I learn, I study, I sit with people who are smarter than me. We collaborate on things together, and and I can learn. But it's interesting because he doesn't say just learn. He says, I want you to grow in grace. So get this, you receive God's grace and then you're supposed to grow in it. What's that mean? (laughs) Like, do I keep sinning so that I keep learning his grace all over again? I don't think that's what he means. It's interesting because in the scriptures, Peter in chapter one, he writes this. He says, I want you to make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge and to your knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection, I want you to add love. What's he saying? If you're gonna grow in God's grace, here's what's gonna happen. Your character is gonna be transformed to become more and more like Christ. That's what it means to grow in God's grace. And you know how you learn that? You don't learn it by a lot of your self-effort. I mean, Peter says, add this to you, do something about it. But guess what? You can't change your own soul. 
You can't change your own character. You can try, but do you know that it's by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit that God changes you? Because you can make your effort, but the problem is when you stop making your effort, you just gravitate back into who you were before. Let me see if I can make sense of this for you. Um, Romans chapter 2 states this. It, It says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Learn something. But just understand the change, it doesn't say transform yourself. It says be transformed. God is the great changer. He uses the Holy Spirit to do it. And I'll explain it this way. When I was a little kid, six years old, 1977, um, my dad, every summer, my mom and dad, we'd go down to this motorhome, my three sisters, and we'd all go down and we'd all sleep in this motorhome. And my dad got this boat. Now, boat is a really generous word for what this was. Um... Let's just show it. It's right here. That's the boat. And that skinny little kid with a mop for a a hairdo, that was me, all right? Six years old, and um, that was a cat yak. It is not much of a boat, all right? But we would go sail on that in Mission Bay down in San Diego. And I have some great memories of that, and I have some not-so-great memories of that. Because it, it was this year that... My dad's like, well, hey, I've taught you how to do this, boy. I think it's about time you go on your maiden voyage, like, hop on. Like, you're not coming? I'm six. He lets me take this boat out the middle of the bay by myself. And I go out this, I mean, this verge is on child abuse. (laughs) He sends me off on this thing, and I know just enough, right? The wind's coming this direction, and so I know I head this way. And then when you need to come about, I know that term, all right? So I'm like, surely I'm a sailor. And so I I start heading up into the wind. And the more you head up into the wind, you get to that kind of critical moment. You know, you're, you're pulling in the sail, heading up into the wind. And one moment, boom, you push the rudder that way. And the boat turns this way and it catches the wind. And now you're heading back to shore, back to safety, right? Well, I go out and doing fine because I'm just heading in one direction, right? Well, the wind starts kind of dying down. I think, looking behind me, like the people on the shore are kind of small at this point, and so I think I'm going to turn around. So I start heading up into the wind, and now I'm going really slow. I'm losing all my wind, and I jam the rudder this way, and it turns this way, and the sails just are flapping in the breeze. There's not a strong enough wind for me to get enough speed to turn around, and I'm thinking, well, let's just try it again, right? And by the way, mind you, this is the same kind of era that Jaws was out. (laughs) I'm six, all right? (laughs) I'm just hearing, dum, 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 dum. So I I head a little farther out, and there's no more wind, and and I I turn it again, and I I get to the place where I can't actually, more I kind of move the rudders, the tail of this thing just kind of going like this. I'm now stuck in the wind. Five minutes go by. Ten minutes go by. I am now just wishing harm on my dad because it's about a half hour and I can see him standing on shore and I don't know if he's like, boy, I taught you better than that or like, what have I done? All I know is I am alone in the middle of this body of water. And when you're six, if you've been to Mission Bay, it ain't huge, right? You can see one end to the other, but when you're six... I mean, you might as well be in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I mean, you, you're scared. And I just drifted, and I start looking over, and there's this, this rock jetty over on this section over here. And I'm sure I'm a couple hundred yards, but I'm just slowly drifting in that direction. And I'm sure I'm either, you know, Gilligan's Island starting to play in the background. I'm like, I'm going to be shipwrecked. And it's just one of those moments that you're kind of like, you're totally... Um, You're totally at the mercy of the wind. And it was on that moment that I developed this, just this deep affection for speedboats. Because if you want to get from A to B, man, turn it on, turn the jets on, let's go. Like, take a motorboat, because it's faster. Because it ain't about the journey, right? It's about getting from A to B. That's just kind of... It's just how I'm wired, right? And some of you guys are wired that way as well. It's not about the journey and, and, you know, how you're doing with your family or the journey of the business. You're like, no, 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 it's about being productive. You're here, you want to get over here, and it's usually up and to the right, so let's get there. But sailing is not like that. You're at the mercy of the wind, and what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you this, that the Holy Spirit, the word for, for spirit is pneuma. 
And it's the same word for wind, spirit, or breath, meaning this. Whether we like it or not, we don't have a spiritual motorboat where we don't like who we are, so we get from A to B and we do it on our own. We wait for the Spirit of God to blow us in that direction. But the question is, I think some of us might be adrift in the bay without our sails up. And you can set yourself up that when the Spirit of God blows, it actually moves you and changes you. You know what it means to hoist your sail? It means that you're in prayer before God. That you come before him, you're like, God, here I am. I not only give you opportunity, but I'm giving you permission right now. Would you change me? That you open the scriptures and you learn about who Christ is because he's the exact representation of who the Father is. And if you know Jesus, you actually know the Father. And if you learn about him, that you're actually be transformed by the renewing of your, your mind. You've read that before. So you, when you do that, you hoist the sail of your life. That when the Spirit of God comes and it blows, you're actually moved. Not this much, but you're prepared and ready to move quickly. You know, that's what transformation's like. It's what it means to grow in the grace of God, that your character becomes more and more like who Christ is. But I'm just going to tell you this. You can do all the things right, and we are still at the mercy of God for him to change us. Amen? And that's why it's really important that we understand how good God is and how full of mercy and full of grace God is. Let, let's start by this. We're going to talk today about how we approach God and how we live before him. When we come to him, how we come to him. And let me ask you this question. How many of you, um, there's probably a person in your life that you would not like to have a meeting with? You, you might be running through bosses and coworkers and people like that. I mean, if they called a meeting with you, you're like, no, I would not like to be there because I'd probably be intimidated. Maybe it's your ex. You know, if they called you and said, hey, we need to meet, you're like, mm, this is not going to go well. Or maybe it was, it was your boss. Hey, we need to meet. Okay, just look forward for a minute and act really spiritual, okay? What if your spouse asked you that? Hey, I think we need to meet. Some of you wouldn't be excited about that. You know why you probably wouldn't be excited to meet with your ex, your spouse, or somebody in your, your business that you're thinking of right now, that you just go, man, I, I just would not want to have a meeting with them. You know why? Either A, you already know how they're going to treat you. You know how they're going to respond to you in that meeting. Or B, you have no idea, because sometimes they're, they're easy to be around, and sometimes they're mean, sometimes they're volatile, I mean, sometimes they're, they're a little degrading towards you. You just don't know. It's this, man, sometimes they're okay, but other times, man, they could blow me up in, in the middle of that meeting. You just don't know, and it's, that, it's, it's almost that intimidation factor of not knowing what you're going to get. Question. What if I could guarantee you that in that meeting you would get grace and favor and cooperation and just mercy and that person would be so loving towards you? What if I could guarantee that? Would you walk into that meeting differently? I think all of us would say that. Yeah, absolutely, if you could guarantee it for me. But let me transition you. What about God? I mean, if you were going to go meet with God, how confident are you in his response to you? Um, I was talking with a, a guy I know who's kind of connected to our family and uh, just recently made friends with him in the last couple months. And, and he said this, he goes, um, he, he's actually connected to um, my daughter's soccer team. And he couldn't figure out, I could, you could kind of tell, like in his mind, he was wondering about this. He's like, you're a pastor. And he goes, I, I'm kind of confused about that, like, because you're one of the most chill guys, his words, chill guys on the sidelines of a soccer game. And I, just, I was kind of laughing because I'm not inside. I just bite my tongue a lot. Because there's moments where referees mess up, and I just think the truth will set them free. I'm about to tell them the truth. Like, you jack that up. Um, and so I, I get a little wound up, a little intense, but most of the time I'm just mm, trying to bite my tongue. Um, and he goes, yeah, you're just pretty relaxed. He goes, I just can't figure it out because like most pastors I knew, you show up at their church and they like stand up front and they yell at you. Like they're just angry with everybody and they're mad at everybody. And like, well, that's probably who God is, right? And I just had this great opportunity to just go, listen, I think as a, as a pastor, even as any follower of Jesus, like we have to represent God well and we have to re represent his character. And if God is a God of grace who loves us and wants a relationship with us, then I just think we got to treat people that way. And it was interesting, like 30 seconds, I had an opportunity to just kind of share that. 
He's like, you know, I think at some point I might come to your church. But a lot of people tell pastors that, right? Try your, try your church sometime. Think that that makes us leave them alone. I don't know. Nice guy, though. But I thought it was interesting because how he viewed a pastor was based off of his experience with people. And how he viewed a pastor. And he, he said this. It was interesting. He said, I think if I showed up in church, God would be like throwing lightning bolts that direction. Because that's what he thinks it would be like to meet God. And we think it's kind of funny, like people don't really believe that. No, people really believe that. They really don't think that if they approached God and they had a meeting with God, that he would accept them. Um, what about you? How do you think that if you just approached God in his throne room, how is it that God would receive you? Um, I want you to get this. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's go there. Because you have this scene where the writer of Hebrews says, I want you to approach God. I want you to approach his throne, and he names the throne something. It's the throne of, and you, you'll, you'll hear this. And it tells you what it is you're going to get from the throne and how it is you're to approach the throne. I'm in Hebrews 4, verse 14. Here's what it says. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that he may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Here's what I want you to imagine. The throne of God. And somebody who is not a follower of Jesus yet, and they want to be, they want to receive God's grace. They want to have that conversion, that turning point. But they have to approach the throne of grace. When they approach the throne of grace, how do they do it? I mean, if you're a fill-in-the-blank person, there's a throne in your book, and there's all in, the, in your notes, and on the left-hand side are all these bullet points. Rob, bring this up. Here's how they approach as an outsider. They're not in the family of God yet, but they're approaching this throne of grace. They're spiritually empty, spiritually dead, deserving penalty for their sins, they're guilty, dissatisfied with life, uncertain about God's response. Stop for a minute. I mean, there's that moment, and that probably what kept people out of the throne room is they didn't know it was the throne of, of grace. Because up until that moment, it was the throne of judgment. Because it's both. It's the throne of judgment for those who, who are not saved. But it's the throne of grace for those who say, yes, Jesus, I believe you died for me. And I believe I got your innocence and I gave you my sin. There was that great exchange that took place. But they come with this faith that says, I believe and I trust that Jesus did that for me. And they come with this repentance to say, you know what? I'm no longer in charge of my life. Jesus is in charge of my life. But they're approaching God's throne room and they're receiving God's grace. Are you still with me right now? So then what about after that? Because who's Peter writing to when he says, when he, when he invites them to grow in the grace of God? And who's the, re, the writer of Hebrews writing to? He's writing to Christians. And he's saying this, I want you to approach the throne room of grace. Well, how do you approach the throne room of grace? It's like you're not receiving grace all over again. When you are living in God's grace, here's the other half of this. You're approaching as an insider. You're approaching as an adopted, loved child of God. So therefore, you get to approach thankful. You get to approach hopeful. You, you get to approach happy and blessed. There might be times where you're hurting. Yeah, God, I did this, or someone did this to me, and I'm wounded or emotionally struggling, and you're hurting. God says, come, approach me with confidence. You, maybe you're guilty of sinning. That's different than being a sinner. When you're sinning as a child of God, it doesn't kick you out of the family. It doesn't separate you from God being your father. It puts this barrier between you and God that he doesn't want there. And you don't want there either. So we come confessing too. And we still maintain this faith. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. But the writer of Hebrews says this. I want you to approach with confidence. I want you to approach with this confidence. Um, so in this, in this scripture, there's two things I want you to see. One is who Jesus is. And I've actually highlighted that in blue in your notes, and so you can see that there. And then there's this concept of what it is that God is expecting you to do. So here, here's the first part. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. What does that mean? 
Jesus is the great high priest. Um, in the Old Testament, the high priest would come into the temple or the tabernacle and he would offer two sacrifices. The first one, he would offer for himself because that priest had sinned. I mean, they would do this once a year. It would be called the sacrifice of atonement, but he would have to offer a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, kill it, bloody sacrifice, messy. Kills it for his own sin. So now that he's innocent, he would then go into this most holy place and offer an animal sacrifice for, for the whole nation of Israel. But he first had to cleanse his own life by a sacrifice. Jesus is called the great high priest. Why? He didn't have to offer any sacrifice for himself. Because the scripture says he was attempted in every way that you and I are, which means he gets it. He understands our weakness. He understands our brokenness. He understands that failure, but he never failed himself. He never sinned. But it's interesting for him to make the sacrifice, he didn't offer an animal. He allowed himself, himself, to die on a cross for our sins. It makes him our great high priest. By his blood, our sins are covered. So he's the great high priest. It then says this, that Jesus ascended into heaven. Or in some versions, it might say he went through the heavens. And the concept is, is that he's sitting at the right hand of, the, of God's throne, and he has converted the throne of judgment into a throne of grace. Do you get that? He's converted the throne of judgment into a throne of grace. Because what does it say? How does he say it? Approach the throne of grace with confidence. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it's the throne of grace for the entire world. It's not true. Read the book of Revelations. There's judgment there. In the book of Revelation, there is judgment for those who are not followers of Christ. And yet it's the throne of grace for those who've been adopted into his family. So I want you to understand this. If you're a follower of Christ, Jesus has converted that throne of grace. It's no longer a throne of judgment for you. I just want you to be aware of that, that when you live under the grace of God, that throne is a place of grace. Not only this, not just at the end of time, but right now here today, the scripture says this, Jesus empathizes with our weakness and temptations. When you're sinning, or you're struggling with something, or there's something broken in your life, and you're just, man, I'm so struggling with it. Do you understand that Jesus gets it? Have you ever said, man, people just don't understand my life? Really? Because Jesus does. He was tempted but he didn't fail. Not only that, but at the end of his life, when he is dying on the cross, the sins of humanity are placed on him. Stop for a minute and just sit on that. The weight of sin sits on Jesus. He knows our brokenness and our frailty. So when you and I sin, we don't get this judgment. We get empathy. Ah, I know what the weight of that feels like. Jesus knew what the separation of God felt like. And so because we have empathy and because we have grace from God, here's what we get to, this we should part. And this is your, God's invitation for you to respond to him. And here's what it says. Let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. That word we profess means just, that's our confession. That we say, God, I trust you. I mean, can I tell you this? When you get stuck in sin, and you feel like, man, my life is broken. Can I invite you to just confess the same words that you've already told Jesus before? I believe that your death paid for that. Because when you were forgiven, you were forgiven for past, present, and future. He just wants a, a, a connection with you, a relationship with you. And yet we can't carry around this guilt and shame and have this connection with God. So we let us hold firmly to this faith that we profess State it again to God. God, I believe that I am covered in this. The other is this. Look at verse 16. It says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. And this is just where I want to land today. I want to land at this place that says, how do you approach God? You will approach him confidently if you know what you're going to get. If you know how he will respond to you. If you believe his promise that it's not a throne of judgment, but it's actually a throne of grace, then you can go to him with absolute confidence. And that's what this writer of Hebrews is trying to say. 
But how many of you, you're really intimidated by God? I'm not sure I can be totally transparent before him. I don't think he's going to actually heal and touch and make better those things that we just don't want to open up to him. I don't think he comes in and kicks in the door of our life and just says, hey, I'm going to do this whether you like it or not. I think that's rare. But when we come to him and just say, God, here's my brokenness. I'm just leaving this before you. His invitation is, I, this is a throne of grace. And listen to the rest of the promise. So that you may receive mercy. And that mercy is for our forgiveness. For the past, the present, the future. Not only that, but you actually, it says, and find grace to help us in our time of need. Grace is God's favor on you. Begs this question. What do you need? I mean today from God. If you knew you could have an appointment with God right now where Jesus is right next to the throne of grace and he is inviting you, come confidently. What would you ask him for? Because we're not abusing God and using him when we ask. He tells us, come and ask. He actually says, you don't have because you don't ask. He invites us to come and ask. But I know there's some of us, we think we have a stingy God and we don't. We have an abundantly generous God. And Peter says, I, I pray for you that you would have an abundance, a whole heap, a whole mess of this grace. So what would you ask him for? I mean, is it something that's personally you're struggling with that nobody knows about? Maybe it's something about your character that you keep hidden and well shoved back in the corner. Maybe it's a relationship that's busted. Maybe it's for one of your kids. But I, I just think that all of us, he, he wouldn't extend this invitation if all of us didn't have something that we'd say, I would ask God for this. What if that's his invitation for you today? That you will know he will receive it, he is empathetic, and he will, he will respond with grace towards you. How confident are you? That's the question. Um, can you tell people who have confidence in God? I think there's some signs and symptoms of them. And I'm going to give these to you real quick and we'll end on this. Here's what it is. Signs and symptoms that people have a confidence in God's grace for them. Here's the first thing. They're humble people. When they're with other people, they treat them with a humility as opposed to a pride or an arrogance. Here's why. If you are confident in your approach of God, you come to the, his throne of grace, that just builds you up. I mean, you have all the confidence you need now because confidence in God develops your self-confidence and your courage in life. And if you're confident before God, you actually don't have to go out there in your relationship with other people and have your self-esteem and your confidence built up. You don't look at them and go, oh, I really need them to believe in me. I really need them to build me up. I really need their encouragement. You, you just don't because you get it from God. Now, I'm not saying we should, we should just stop encouraging each other and look at people like, ah, you're so weak. Get encouraged from God, not me. And don't, don't try that. It doesn't work in your marriage. It doesn't work in your friendships. I'm just saying. But people who have come before God's throne of grace with confidence and do it again and again, they allow God to build them up. They're not actually looking to receive anything from you. Not only that, but they're actually able to serve you. And we all know, like, you've met people like this, right? Who, who just, you can tell there's just a neediness in their soul because every time they talk to you, they're building themselves up. If you've never met someone like that, it might be you. I'm sorry, I said that out loud, huh? Um, the second thing, let's move on. What you can tell somebody is just confident with God because they don't live in victimville any longer. I mean, they're not a victim of their own sin any longer. It's not that they don't mess up, but victimville is, I just don't have a choice. I, I've been this way for all of my life and I'm always just gonna be this weak and this tired and this is just who I am. They've accepted their sin. They actually believe in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that says no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but he will always provide a way out. Stop for a minute. Do you believe that? That when you sin in the midst of it, you're just going, man, I've done this a, a thousand times, a million times. I actually can't even change this. Get out of victimville. Because when you have a confidence before God, you are confident that he will empower you, that he always gives you a way out in the middle of sinning. You can stop and go, I don't actually have to do this right now. 
I mean, before those words go out your mouth, in your head, in your heart, it can be, I don't actually have to say this. I can actually end this ungodly conversation. I actually don't have to cheat. I don't have to steal. I don't have to, to lust this way. I can end it. And the Spirit of God starts blowing through your life to change you. Number three is this. You know somebody's confident in life when they find the awesome in life. I stole this from a guy by the name of Mike Foster. He writes a book called Graceonomics. It's the economy of God's grace. And it's a great short little book. If you want to dig in farther into these concepts about what it looks like to show yourself grace, um, pick up his book, Graceonomics. Um, he tells the, the story in that book of um, a, a shoe company. And this is like eras ago. And they were sending two marketing representatives to Africa to see, is there an opportunity there for an extended market in this region of Africa? And these two guys went, and the first guy sent back a message, and he just said, stop production. There's no possibility here. People don't even wear shoes. And the other guy, who was the other marketing person, went to the same region, looked at this, and he said, there is a wonderful opportunity here. Nobody even has shoes. If we are people that come before the throne room of grace and God meets us there, our perspective is different because we believe that God has all the resources we need for life and godliness. We believe that we have a generous God so we can take the optimal view in life that whenever a need pops up, God's resources are there to meet it. They, they just choose to find the awesome in life. The fourth thing is this. The people who are confident in Christ, they focus on their wholeness or greatness in Christ without ostriching the hardship. Life is hard, amen? It's hard. But we have a choice of sitting around and complaining about it all the time and focusing on it, or we have the opportunity to go, you know what, no, 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 Christ has done something in me. Here's how you know the difference. What's your favorite worship song? Broken I run to you. That song drives me crazy. I mean, it's a good song. It has its place in the kingdom of God. But if you ever come into a church and that's the first thing you sing, that it tells you the theology of the church. Y'all walking in, broken, messed up, or we, whoa, it's so bad, I hope Jesus can do something with this. Uh, that would have to be a whole church of people who have not yet received the grace of God. Because according to the scriptures, you've been made whole in Christ. You've been set free in Christ. You are being transformed in Christ. So when we walk in, we don't come in to receive God's grace. We come in to celebrate God's grace. That he's already done something in us. And we can sing songs like, mighty to save. God has done it. Yeah? And I just think, I mean, there's a theology behind, Josh is writing this down right now. There's a theology behind this worship that we come in. And he knows it. It's one of the reasons why I hired this guy. Because he, he's not about broken worship. Like, hey, we're so messed up, and whoa, were we? Worship is first and foremost our presence before God where we celebrate what he's already done for us in Christ. If you get nothing else from today, grab onto that and just ask the question, who am I in Christ? God's already done this thing in me. I gotta move on, I'm gonna run out of time. These people who are confident before the throne room of grace, they talk about their failures and they don't waste their pain. Have you met people who just... They can't talk about the hurts that they have because they're still so painful. There is a season for that. But when people have continuously come before the throne of grace, they give God permission and opportunity to heal that so that they don't have wasted pain. Their pain can become a scar for someone else to learn from. I mean, when it says that God, in the scriptures, that God has comforted us so that we can comfort others in the similar affliction. God, don't waste your pain. I mean, if you've been through something, when, when, when God when, transforms you before his throne of grace, use that pain so that somebody else can be blessed by it. Last thing is this. People who are confident in approaching God, they show grace to their own dark side. You got a dark side? I do. I'm not proud of it, trust me. But you do too. Because until you get to heaven... That's the only place where perfection is. And maybe people know your dark side. Praise God. Because the secrecy of a dark side, there's power in it. And when people know it, there's a release there. You will sin. But have you met people when they sin, 
they just become so self-deprecating, like, I'm so stupid, I'm so lame, I don't get it, I, I need to, and they just beat on themselves. It's like Jesus is standing next to them go, wow, chill out. Like, you're harder on yourself than I am. I died for that stuff. How come you keep bringing it up? Let it go. I just think people who come before God's throne room, they have a grace for themselves. That even when they get it wrong, they confess it and they feel guilty. We're not making an excuse for sin. Please don't hear that. We're not making an excuse for sin. But here's the invitation. Come to the throne. And what you're going to find at the throne, that it's a throne of grace. So you can come before God confidently. And here's what he'll do there. He'll change you. But we got to come to the throne. It's not a throne of judgment. It's a throne of grace. So here's where I'd like to end. It's just a simple question for you. What would you ask him for today? What would you ask him for for you? There's another question there. What would you ask him for for someone else? Can I ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment? Maybe you know exactly how to answer that question. I would ask God for, then ask him. In this space right now, would you just ask him, God, I need this. Maybe it's transformation, maybe it's peace. Maybe it's released from something that's gripped your soul. Maybe it's help in a relationship right now. Maybe you need wisdom. Maybe you've been waiting and you've been asking the same prayer over and over and over again. Just keep waiting on God. He'll answer you. What would you ask him for? And one of the beautiful things about the throne room of grace is we can go there on behalf of other people. And we can ask for God's grace to flow to them too. Who would you pray for? And what would you pray for? I'll give you 30 seconds to just come before God and ask him for that. Would you stand with me as I close this in prayer? God, we are not beggars that are coming to extract something from a stingy God. We're your kids, and we just crawled up in your lap and asked for something, God, that we would say, God, would you provide us this because you sit on the throne of grace, and we just believe that, and so we trust that you will give generously to us, and we love you, God. We love you and we want to come to your throne of grace again and again and again because that's what it means to grow in your grace and that's what it looks like to live in your grace, that you would keep changing us, God. And if you believe that you serve a generous God who today wants to answer that prayer, would you simply say amen?